that piece of music I happened to choose uh, for a production of a play that I put on some time ago by Anthony Mengele called uh, Cigarettes and Chocolate, which some of you might not know, but some of you might. It's about a girl called Gemma who one day decided not ever to speak again and only listen to Bach's St. Matthew Passion. Um, the extraordinary thing was that it fitted the play very well. And it is extraordinary that Bach and Mengele had 300 years of separation. And it sounded perfectly beautiful. And I wondered what would happen in 300 years' time, whether Michael Jackson's uh, music might be used uh, for uh, another play. And talking of Michael Jackson, I switched on television one afternoon, I saw his funeral. And it reminded me so much of Beethoven's um, funeral, because quite by accident, there were about 20,000 people at each of the funerals. Uh, of course, a million people tried to get tickets for uh, Michael Jackson's, uh, but all the crowds gathered around um, the funeral of Beethoven. And admittedly, there were slight differences. I mean, Michael Jackson had Lionel Richie, uh, but Beethoven had Schubert uh, as a torchbearer. Uh, but they were both superheroes. And yet, Michael Jackson has probably sold 15, 16, 20 million uh, CDs, whereas Beethoven a, a fraction of that. And it is a slight mystery, and this is why we're here tonight. Um, and helping me answer the question is um, uh, polymath Stephen Fry, uh, who is so irritatingly <laughs> omniscient. Um, <laughs> sometimes known as the most irritating man in Britain, but we love him. And Tim Lahore, who is the genius, uh, who managed somehow to plug six million listeners out of nowhere uh, to create this amazing uh, station called Classic FM. So these are two real conoscente. But much more importantly, I want to engage you, the audience. I'm going to be a sort of quasi dimbleby tonight, and I'm going to ask people to ask questions or even give a comment. Without further ado, the questions I raise, the big questions, where is classical music going to go? Are the great composers and their compositions going to be uh, forgotten? Uh, will they go into obscurity, uh, etc.? These are huge questions, and I want to invite First of all, uh, Stephen Fry to say a few words, and then Tim, and then I'm going to come to you. Stephen, all right. a big question. Yeah, I'll begin. I, I'll begin as we've been extremely unhappy at the moment. Um, um, I, some of you may uh, have followed, um, I tweeted about an hour or so ago um, that it would be an interesting idea if anybody who followed me um, could uh, contribute to a hashtag, new name for classical music, because it, it sometimes strikes me um, th th without being, I hope, too much of a spin doctor about it, that the very name classical music is off-putting to so many people. Um, uh, to those who know music, it's stupid because it's actually only one period in music, in the continuum of music. You might say there's Baroque, Classical, Romantic, and so on, and the classical is only the one period that is mostly known, you might say, for, for Mozart, but that's, that's nitpicking. Of course, what people mean by Classical music is the sort of music that's played on Classic FM or Radio 3. Um, it's all, oh. So people put, some people put up suggestions. I've, I've, I've got a list of them here. I won't go through them all because it's too, too distressing. Um, um, <laughs> some of them are distressing because they're just, what? Uh, like, it should be called orchestral music, which, well, out you go, James, bye. <laughs> um, um, others, uh, 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 but the, a huge number, I mean, a really large number, uh, with, you know, with exclamation marks and little winks and things said, should be called shit, outdated, <laughs> um, uh, I irrelevant, uh, dead. Uh, or, or, uh, and to someone like me, for whom it is none of those things, I thought, oh, crikey, that, that really is the size of the task ahead of those of us who would hope that there are young people um, who are given the opportunity for, let me put it the way E.M. Forster put it when he described just one particular piece of music, 
perhaps the most famous piece of symphonic music there is, um, um, uh, Opus 67 by, by, by Beethoven, the, 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 the C minor symphony known as number five, or as we prefer to call it, da 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 da. Um, <laughs> now, it, it's famous for all kinds of music. It was particularly famous in the Second World War because da 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 happens to be the Morse code for V, for victory. So we used it rather a lot on the radio, uh, or the wireless it was then called, as a, as, a, as a symbol, the fact that we could take Beethoven, a German, and appropriate him. That immediately said that there was something international about music. We knew from everything Beethoven had written and said in his Heilige Gestalt Testament, in, in, in his political writings, in the way he ripped up his dedication to the Eroka, to, 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 to Napoleon. We knew that he was a political animal who would have nothing to do with Nazism. I mean, we might as well claim him. But the words that Forster used to describe the fifth in Howard Zen, you may remember, it's a wonderful passage, the sublimest sound ever to penetrate a human ear. Now, that's a, that's a grand claim, and people may disagree with it, of that particular piece, which has now become so well-known. He was writing that in Howard Zen, which was, what, 1911 or something? Um, 1908, even, I think, was published. So that's a long time ago when there were, there were a few records available, but you came to music, you sat, and you listened. Whereas now, listen to music, you carry it around with you wherever you like. It's become a different entity. It's become a different commodity. And dance music seems to have overtaken in every respect the kind of music that you have to sit down to and take, to take on a journey inside yourself. The music that explodes in your soul. The music that, because it is about nothing, is about everything. Its very universality is what makes, to me, the abstract sounds of whatever we call this kind of music so specific. But how you communicate that to people for whom Beyonce is actually music, I do not understand. I don't mean <laughs> to be a snob about this. I agree with most people. There is music, and why should we separate it? I, I love jazz music. I think the great American songbook is perhaps one of the greatest achievements of mankind, the music of Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and Jerome Kern and Cole Porter, and I said Cole Porter, and the Gershwins, for example. I think it stands up with anything the man has ever done. It stands up at Chartres Cathedral or Shakespeare. Uh, I, I think there are voices and singers and uh, current and dead, and the death of Amy, Amy Winehouse left me dumbstruck with disappointment. I never heard so, for shattering the wonderful singing voice. But on the other hand, I watch X Factor and I see this repulsive noise coming out. <laughs> and, 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 um, for Simon Cowell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I, I wonder if there is any hope mm. for people being able to listen anymore. OK. Well, that's um, my opinion. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, uh, you don't want to no, spend all your time. No. They need, the audience need to come back and yeah. pay more money yeah. to hear you. Yeah. Tim, <laughs> um, can I just say, you know those moments where you say, oh, shit, I'm sat next to a polymath. I've yeah. got one of those moments yeah. right now. <laughs> um, I personally, I, I don't think there's as much as a crisis in classical music as people make out. I think, uh, I think it has some issues. I think if you, you mentioned the Gershwins, um, uh, it's his birthday today, in fact. Uh, it is, yeah. It's, I think, 1898 or something. But he said, um, he used to say to it, he, he travelled all around the world with his friend Oscar, uh, doing all these yeah. concerts and doing all these, con yeah, Oscar Levant. Yeah. And uh, he said the difference between uh, talent and genius is about this much because on, a, on the trains where they used to travel everywhere, he got choice of the bottom bunk and Oscar was forced onto the, <laughs> the rather aw awful top bunk. But I, I think that period is, is possibly the key to why classical music has an issue if it has it. And that is because when the first recordings were made, we're talking about 1907, 1910, all those, that, that hi hiatus and that was a really big time for recording, largely vocal a lot of it in, initially, but they record, you know, one of the first pieces recorded was the Pastoral Symphony by Beethoven. Well, we're still recording that today. Um, you know, uh, in your blurb to this, you said, if Lady Gaga um, can sell millions and yet Mozart... You know, if Lady Gaga had been around 100 years ago and released cover versions of the same piece of music mm. every four or five years for the next 100 years, she wouldn't be selling millions now. I think there is a, uh, a disjoint between uh, the music that, that we call classical music now, modern classical music, contemporary serious music, whatever you want to call it, and the artists playing the original version of classical music, which is what classic FM would probably term classical music. In, incidentally, when I did a little brief poll of our, some members of our audience, uh, they indeed, they, they suggested orchestral as well, they suggested original, uh, there's a few suggestions for real, for proper, 
But in the end, the overriding suggestion, uh, I mean, it was a very small poll, but the overriding suggestion was, we don't think it's broke, the word, uh, leave it where it is. We like classical. We like this reference to a great bygone age because it's our favorite music, and it says, um, it says classic as well. In, not, not, without, not with a, you know, a, a big plug for classic, but it, it has that element of a classic in it too. Yeah, but I mean, your station is a testament uh, to exactly what you say, that it has a very wide audience indeed. Worth remembering the snobbish reception that Classic FM first received when it arrived. Yes, of course. People who were used the to... Radio 3, to Radio 3, where, yes. where if you played a Brooklyn Symphony, you played every movement of the Brooklyn Symphony, which might be an hour and ten minutes, whereas you, at first, quite for, for obvious reasons, started to give them sound bites, you know, be Pachelbel's Canyon, a, a canon followed by, um, you know, followed by another popular piece, and so on, and you do top tens, and you shamelessly do tunes people knew, Ness and Dormer and things like that, until you <laughs> gradually built up an audience, and now I think you can be congratulated for having as wide uh, okay. a repertoire as anyone else. One, 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 one tiny point on that, and I, it's my favourite story about the, those early days of Classic FM, is uh, when Classic started, Radio 3 had its 1.9 million listeners, whatever it was, I forget the exact figure, Couple of quarters in, because they measure these things endlessly, Classic FM started to gain an audience of three or four million. And you look back at Radio 3, and it still had its 1.9. It had found an entirely new bunch of people to play classical <coughs> music to. For whatever reason, it, it, you know, this is only 20 years ago, not, well, not quite 20. I don't think classical music has got a big problem. I think basically you just need to know how to, how to shine the light on it. Well, I was one of the critics uh, at the beginning, but I think your 1.9 million listeners, the Radio 3, they're still asleep. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, that's what. Look, listen, I, I want to bring the audience in now. I was going to ask James, but he hogged the piano at the beginning, so I will ask him later. Um, so who would like to ask a question uh, to our uh, experts here or make a comment? Uh, in the store there are two. Yeah, there's a man here with a beard. Is that, yeah. While, while he's getting the microphone, may I say that I, I, I can go to signing queues and things like that, and you can instantly spot a Terry Pratchett signing queue. <laughs> um, you can go to a certain concert and you go, oh, that's a Wagnerian concert. <laughs> a lot of black leather jackets there. <laughs> or, or, um, and this, I have to say, I'm incredibly impressed by the variety of age and dress and sparkle amongst you all. So um, <laughs> it, is, it is a real pleasure to have such a we diverse can, we can have We can have the bonus of asking <laughs> one of your it, it telephone true. numbers the at the front, end. The front of house people were saying they had never seen such a diverse bunch at, really? at this concert hall before. So, Excellent. So I okay, know what that means, um, first, good to know. first, you want to make yeah. a comment or, um, um, or, a, or a question? I, I wanted to ask what you thought um, the effect of film scores because I assume they sell reasonably well and they're still released regularly and they still affect people, even people who might not necessarily buy classical music. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, really uh, you're, you're, the, you're the expert on film music. Well, um, I, I, two I, minutes. It is a passion of mine and, and um, certainly if I was born with a, a composing gene in my body, I suspect I would have turned to, to film composition. Um, it, it, at around the time of, uh, if you want to be historical about it, around the time of the second Viennese school, around the time of, uh, of, of Berg and Schoenberg and so on, there was a great, great genius. Uh, Mahler, when he heard him playing um, uh, as, as a child of 10, span around the room saying, this is the new Mozart. And that was a composer called Erich Korngold, who was one of my favorite composers. And he was snapped up by Max Steiner, who was another genius, also an Austrian Jew, um, who had uh, completed the entire opera course at the Conservatoire in Vienna by the time he was 12. And, um, and Max Steiner went on to create Warner Brothers' great studio, and indeed some of the most famous film scores of the age, including uh, things like Gone with the Wind and Now Voyager and so on, Dark Victory, and many, many, many of the, the uh, and indeed Casablanca he wrote the score for. Uh, and there's a famous line of Betty Davis, who's going down this fucking staircase? Me or Max, Max Stein? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there's, there's just, just as an interesting story, um, Korngold was writing, I think, two masterpieces. He wrote as a, as a film uh, writer. He wrote many others as a series composer, in inverted commas. Um, one, one was The Sea Wolves, the, the other was um, The Great Warner Brothers, one of the very first colour pictures, um, the Errol Flynn, Robin Hood. And uh, Max Steiner went to visit him uh, at Warner, and he saw him packing. This was in the 30s, and he said, what, 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 what are you doing, what are you doing? He said, I, I, this shit, I bought this, to cut the music for these fucking movies. I'm going back 
to Austria. Austria has just been annexed, by, uh, annexed again, you know, uh, but by the Anschluss, the, the, the Germans had marched into Austria, his home country. Uh, he knew if he went back, he'd be arrested. He was a Jew, he was an intellectual. The, the Nazis were, but he couldn't bear the idea of being thousands of miles away, making stupid things like pictures. And Max Steiner said to him, so what, 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 what are you working on? He said, that's the, the Robin Hood, you know. That, uh. He said, but that's brilliant, he said. Max Steiner said, that's brilliant. He said, but you, you've got sword fights, you've got, the, you've got the Nazis, Guy of Gisborne and the Sheriff of Nottingham, and you have the free people. He says, oh, put it into your music. That's all you can do. You can't fight Nazis. But you've got, you got thin, pasty hands. You've got you, this, this tall. He says, but you've got music that will defeat them forever. Forever. And he, and he meant it. And Korngold put his clothes back in his wardrobe, and he sat down and he wrote one of the greatest music scores that, that cinema has ever known. If you watch the sword fight between Basil Rathbone and, uh, and, and Errol Flynn, um, he wrote above it, he wrote above it, death to Nazism, death to Nazism, death to Nazism. I know some of you are laughing, I don't know why. I mean, it's, <laughs> it seems, okay, to, me calm down. It, it right. seems <laughs> to me to be an incredibly beautiful and fantastic yeah. point yeah, about, about what music can do yes. and, and, and what a musician can do. And, and, and it's all he could do, even though he was thousands of miles away. So yes, I, in answer to your question, I think film, personally I'm not a great fan of the James Horners of this world, who I think are rather pastichers, uh, but there are some great ones. I mean, John Williams was, was, was fine at his very best, and there are some, um, you know... Um, Mariconia. Uh, of course, Mariconia, yes. and, 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 and um, indeed. And Nino yes. Rota, of course. Yeah. Fantastic. But, but I mean, this is one of the points that uh, I was going to make, is that, in fact, uh, classical music is able to be promoted and perpetuated through films, which happens to be uh, in our medium today. I mean, you know, starting from Vera Madigan with uh, Mozart 21, uh, Rack 2, uh, uh, Brief Encounter, Mahler, Death in God knows where. Let's not forget that commercials as well are invariably symphonic or they steal classical for the soundtrack yeah. and movie scores. I mean, I was lucky enough to work on one of the Lord of the Rings films and recording the score. It was for the London Philharmonic Orchestra, it was recorded at Abbey Road, proper conductor, the whole outfit. And so I think it is very much alive, classical music, just perhaps in a slightly different way. Something medium. you want to add about film music? No, only that I think it's just like any other area of music. There, are, there is good and there is bad. There is some yeah, great yes. scores out there. We also ought to add that the father and granddaddy, and I, know, I, I won't beat this drum too often, film music couldn't have existed without Richard Wagner and the leitmotif. Oh, I just, sorry. Right, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes? I sort of noticed um, that you made a comparison to Lady Gaga. And, and obviously, uh, a lot of um, young people are very familiar with Stephen um, for the Harry Potter um, audio uh, readings and also for QI, which is hilariously funny. Um, but how, how, I wonder how we can reach the, the young people who, who might sort of go into HMV and go straight for... Um, Please. Sorry, this is such a great question. You, you go to HMV, if, even if you can find one now, uh, and, and you want to buy... The only, Circus is the only one left. You yeah. want to buy classical music, and they shunt you down to the basement like you're trying to buy a kind of midget pornography. It's like it's <laughs> out of the way. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and even more, even more disturbingly, you think, OK, I want a bit of Beethoven, maybe the Fifth Symphony. There's, 50 different versions of it, invariably with an 18th century French watercolor on the cover. <laughs> and you don't know, so I would give up. You know, and you know, places like this, incredible though they are, I mean, I think sometimes I, maybe I got on the wrong bus tonight, ending up here at the Barbican, but you know, I, I'm playing at the Jazz Cafe or Latitude Festival, different venues. That I find the average age of the audience at a lot of my gigs and a lot of other artists now is in their early 20s, mid 20s. And it I is think the it's... fault. It is the fault for a lot of the pr promoters who have yes. been spoiled, and they don't want to change, and they 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 don't know how to, and that's the problem. They like the old I, I think James has hit the nail on the head. I may be glass half full, but I think the festivals uh, are a really amazing new avenue for a way of interacting differently with classical music. Glastonbury led the way, probably, but uh, the Latitude, 
Alex James has done his Harvest Festival, which had opera as, as a main part of the festival. I think it's a, a new way to interact with classical music. And also, it's absolutely right, and, uh, and also the connection with popular artists. When I was um, in my 20s, swing music was unbelievably uh, unfashionable and unpopular. No one had heard of, really heard of Benny Goodman, and no one had really knew anything about Nelson Riddle or uh, any of the great arrangers. That my favourite album um, uh, when I was 20 was uh, was Frank Sinatra Live at the Sands, which had been which was with Count Basie. It was arranged by an I think it was 19 year old uh, musician called Quincy Jones. Who, who then became, of course, a lot more famous because he had something to do with, 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 with Thriller. Um, and people <coughs> then got to know his name a bit more. But, but, uh, and, uh, he many, married many, somebody very pretty. Many of the other things he's done. Who. But now, Tony Bennett's second set of duets of entirely swing music with country musicians, with Lady Gaga, with Amy Winehouse, mm. with all kinds of performers. Uh, suddenly, there's no problem with that crossover. And, and the very same age kids who would have been embarrassed by the idea of listening to Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett in the 1980s and are perfectly happy to do so. And, uh, and Shirley Bassey can take the stage at Glastonbury and absolutely kill them. And, and I think it's just getting the opportunity for people to have their ears open. And it is by association very often. Yeah. Okay, let's have a few more. Uh, yes. Today we're trying to compare Lady Gaga and classical music. I think, is it are we comparing something which can be compared? Let me explain my point. Um, if we look back into the 18th or 19th century, are we sure that the classical music was the popular music? What I mean is, sorry, a bit nervous. Um, after the record uh, era began, uh, so many people which did not have access to, in my opinion at least, to opera, or to all those magnificent symphony performances, say, no, no. Uh, earlier, they got no, access to No, they did. I mean, in, in Beethoven's time, in fact, he couldn't even fill his own concert in 1808 <laughs> when he had produced, when he, on the program, the fifth and sixth and the symphony and the fourth piano concerto because there was a man called Rossini. And all the Italians, uh, Italian composers, came and usurped uh, the, the, the concert hall, and, uh, and people rushed along. They were the, the pop stars of, of, of their age. So, so absolutely. This is the question. I mean, are yeah. we sure that the people, say, in villages, which do well, have... Well, no, there was no recording industry then, so absolutely, there, were, there absolutely. wasn't even the possibility of them being as popular as they, are, as they were in the, in the 1920s. I take your point. There was folk music, there, was, there were broad, there were, you know, ballads, there was all kinds of other popular music of the time. There was parliament music in Victorian age uh, of a slightly soupy sentimental type, which is not very popular now. Um, and it is absolutely true that it would be wrong to suggest that these giant edifices of Bach and, and Handel and, and, and Beethoven and Chopin and so on were quite the superstars of their day. We say they were immensely popular and famous, but amongst a, a, an elite class. There's no question about that. That is true of Jane Austen. That's Jane Austen also only wrote for a tiny audience, including the Prince Regent. But if you allow people, ordinary people, access to something that may or may not have been created for an elite in powdered wigs, if it is great art, then it becomes popular. The most popular book written in the English language, three is The Hobbit, make of that what you will, two, if you count them as one, is the trilogy of Lord of the Rings, and one, it always shocks people, it still shocks me to this day, I'm thrilled and slightly surprised and baffled, is A Tale of Two Cities. Now, it could have been any. You might have thought it had been Great Expectations or David Copperfield. But um, the point is it's not for whom the audience is written or how popular they were at that time. In the end, it's how great they are. And that's all that matters. And whether they were written for one duke, as is in the case of, or one uh, elector, as is in the case of some of the greatest Bach music. Bach is very good. Uh, uh, Bach I mean, was Bach, not writing for If it masses. wasn't of Mendelssohn, yeah. he might not have been as popular as we are today, and you wouldn't be playing his music. Or, 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 admittedly, uh, yeah. uh, uh, slightly interfered with by uh, Italian. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you thank you very much. Listen, uh, I think let's have some, uh, the five Talk pound upstairs. seats on the, on the, on the uh, circle. So yeah. some cheaper questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say about the point of things being being able to relate the idea that Lady Gaga is very popular and something is written for a small audience. I think might be hitting upon the problem is 
People think that music that was written for a very small audience and very elite people is maybe too elite for them to talk about. And when you think, well, that music makes me feel just shivery down my spine, it's something that if you say to people, you worry they're going to laugh at you or think, well, that's not a very sophisticated answer for what might be considered very sophisticated music. And perhaps opening up talk to being able to say, I like that song because it makes my spine shivery is a way of opening it up to more people. Well, good for you. Yes. Yeah, it has to pass the small hairs on the back of the neck test, doesn't yeah, it? Yes. But yeah. it's accessibility. Ga Lady Gaga people like it because they think I can talk about this because it speaks about something that I like or that I can talk about with my friends. One of the reasons I so admire Lady Gaga is that she's not afraid to have a, a quotation from the German poet Rilke tattooed on her arm and is not afraid to, to experiment at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the very highest pitch of, of the avant-garde and is as interested in classical music as she is in dance music and modern music and so on. Uh, and uh, naturally, uh, the, the average Briton would therefore call her pretentious because, because fear dominates the British when it comes to art. Fear is the first, first emotion to come. Am I going to look a fool if I cry because I'm moved? Am I going to look a fool because I admire something and someone is going to tell me that the emperor is naked? Am I going to look a fool? Well, the first thing we all have to be is unafraid of being a fool. And if music touches you and makes you cry, makes you jump up in the air, makes you scream, then never apologise. In a okay. different way, of course, that is, that is one of the problems. <laughs> that is, that's one of the issues with classical music itself, the fear of actually admitting that you not necessarily don't know what is out there, you don't know the names, you don't know the terms, but you're, you will accept the music when it washes over you. Or when to clap or what to yeah. wear. Or yeah. 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 Yes, OK, go on. I was just going to say, um, Lady Gaga is, as you said, a fantastic pianist in her own right. Um, is the answer perhaps to allow uh, popular musicians, or certainly musicians that reach a larger audience, um, to reach a classical audience also? Um, I mean, the, the, the thing that comes to my head is uh, Metallica had a fantastic concert about 12 years ago yeah. with, um, is it, was it Michael Kamen, perhaps, um, called um, S&M, uh, Symphony in Metallica. It was, <laughs> I guess, a little like that. Um, but I, I would say that, that's, I suppose, what links my love of classical music and my link of heavy metal music. And is there a chance of, I suppose, more of that happening? And would that allow classical music to reach that wider audience if Lady Gaga were to... Uh, maybe I don't, I don't remix Beethoven or something. I, I, I don't know. But <laughs> I think that's already happening. You know, I mean, certainly where, where David comes from in Hong Kong, you know, Yundi Lee and Lang Lang, they play at major rock festivals and they're treated like rock stars. They're mobbed. I mean, I wish walking down Maida Vale. I was... <laughs> <laughs> but it is happening, and, and there are collaborations. Okay, the girl, the, the girl in the red skirt. Yes. Um, do you think that the changes in the way classical music is taught to young people have been good or bad? Good or bad? Good question. I, I missed the question, sorry. Uh, is it good or bad the way in which classical music is taught to the young? Um, I think it, it varies so much, like anything. It's a bit of a lottery round. I think what, what we would all benefit from is what actually started as a social initiative, if we can get onto El Sistema. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell everyone about um, the Venezuelans, uh, the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra of Venezuela, came up through this system called The System, uh, where they initiated about 125, I think, youth orchestras. But more than that, they used the orchestra as, a, as just a, a representative of the family. They Making music. Total music. submersion for a, a number of schools. The, the orchestra became uh, the family that some of these children didn't have because it was in a lot of deprived areas. It was used as a social action initiative. Yeah. It was Go to Caracas. Right, yeah. next. <laughs> but it's being repeated, it's, it's being repeated been all over the world. Yeah. And the important thing about music, and I mean, pe people say, well, sport does the same, football does the same in, in Rio. But in, in Rio, you've got to be male, you've got to be fleet of foot, you've got to be coordinated in a very particular way to be good at football. Uh, it, musicians can be round and pimply, they can be, you know, they can be introverted or extroverted, they don't have to run fast. Any type of human being can, can engage in music. And that is, that, that is very important to Dudamel and all the great pros, proselytes of El Sistema. And the interesting thing, though, when they tried it in, in Colombia, they didn't use the orchestra as the model, and it didn't work anywhere near as much. The orchestra was this symbol of the family and this unity and this, this team you didn't have at home, possibly. OK, there's another girl there. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, following on from that point, um, what's your opinion of schools and education picking apart like symphonies like we studied... Mozart's Jupiter Symphony and 
some of us in the class felt we did it to the point in which we started to resent the music. Um, yeah. I was just wondering what your opinion was on that. Like Shakespeare, so I suppose. Oh, in for analysis. Oh, and I God. was getting so upset uh, by this. Now, I was, if I'm in a sarcastic mood and not, not very cheerful, I say, yeah, yeah, we had to do geography at school. I remember they took us to the Lake District and they talked about the, the various ge geological layers. So it just completely ruined the Lake District. Yeah. I find it so ugly now. <laughs> I mean, it's just... <laughs> uh, but, but I do agree on the other. I do agree on the other. I mean, the Jupiter Symphony is one of my very favorite pieces. I mean, you know, Mozart's Lake Symphony is just a whole new universe of sound. But like anything, you, 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 can, you can be accused of over-reading and over-analyzing. You can over-analyze the way a dewdrop falls off a leaf. Because, to, uh, you know, as poets point out, to, to, to anybody lying down and watching a dewdrop falling off a leaf, it can represent the summit of human ambition, it can, it can, it can represent futility, it can represent beauty. It can, it, you know, the human brain is incapable of looking at anything without making it a metaphor for themselves, their lives, their love, their hope, their disappointment. And that is what makes music so extraordinary, because a painting is of something. <laughs> Even an abstract painting is of paint that you can touch and see and has a colour you can describe. Music is so abstract. Even programme music, the kind of music that Bruckner wrote, where he described the story going on in the symphony. Even programme music is so abstract that you, everybody can listen. I mean, for me, when I teach, which I very rarely do because I'm not a musician, but I have been to schools, the one thing I find people really first get is if I play them a concerto, it can be the Emperor Concerto, perhaps the best known piano concerto, uh, uh, Beethoven V, uh, 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 piano concerto, and I say, just imagine, it's not, it's not the truth of it, but imagine the piano is an individual trying to express himself, and the orchestra is the world, fate, society trying to shut him up. And sometimes the individual gets society back on their side, and there is no... I don't know of a concerto you can't listen to in those terms that doesn't actually thrill you. It's true of the great violin concertos, it's true of all the concertos I know. It is the individual against society. And there's no way you can do that in a play or a novel or a painting or a sculpture that is so fantastically deep and profound. And you listen and you go, yes, get at him, you know. And then, and then, and then suddenly the, the, the individual voice is drowned out by the orchestra. And then suddenly the individual it uh, comes back, it just, it just comes back again, and in the end, sometimes in a joyous way, they play together, and, 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 and everything is magnificent. But uh, the, Howard Goodall, who is, is one of our finer choral in particular composers, but also a musical writer and an absolute passionate advocate of teaching music in schools, spends most of his life going around schools, and he says the... The thing that's, that's depressing is not how a symphony or a piece of music is given over to children, but how the music isn't taken out of them. It's there in them. And, I mean, it does, it does require the also the individual to make an effort. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I learned Shakespeare before I could speak English, but I loved it. Mm. But that was lucky because I responded to it. Yes. And, and you have to make an effort to find you know, what do you find in the Jupiter Symphony? I don't Symphony? know, I disagree to an extent. I think well, one of... Well, don't. I haven't got time. <laughs> <laughs> it's arm wrestling. Well, one minute, because you're, you're going to play some music in a minute. You can't halt all the time. Go on, you. Yeah. I came to my life passion for classical music um, through playing, and it just to tie in with what Stephen was saying, people have a book that gives them their love of reading, whether it's Tale of Two Cities, the new David Nichols one, which they've made a film of, the book that gives you your love of reading. Concert life, in inverted commas, is incredibly young, and you'll find that most music going back through the ages was people, you know, Haydn and Monteverdi, they worked in domestic settings. So you've got people coming together to manipulate the music for themselves in concerts, orchestras, magicals. I think the way forward now, talking about this question of education is to allow people to play this music somehow but of course I suppose with the economic climate what it is and is it important and you know I find it really sad that instrumental ed education is not really open to a huge amount of people. I, so. I'd, I'd love to respond to that before James does and that's I, I always walk past you say sorry uh, you see those shops those art shops in London I can't remember what they're called but they have this phrase across the top let's fill this town with artists and every time I see it, I think Let's fill this town with musicians instead, because music would be so fantastic. But 
you, you almost feel there's a, a fear of saying it about music because uh, was it someone called it the most unintelligible of the art forms on its own, the standalone. And I don't think it is. I think if people devoted more time in schools to just even offering it up, as you say, offer it up, listen to it. Some of those pieces I learned at school have stayed with me forever, for absolutely forever, and they're the pieces I love. So you've all been very nice about popular music, but do you actually think that classical music has got more intrinsic merit? It's a really hard one to answer that. I, I, you know, there's a part of me that says, you know, that's why we have the great programme Desert Island Discs, which is the one you would, you, you would get from the, from the sinking ship. And for me, the, the, the pieces of music that I would, would get from the sinking ship would probably be uh, seven out of the eight that you're supposed to get would be classical music. For me, it, it lasts longer. It, it, it seems to have more infinite resource. But it's, I think the crossover point is an interesting one. I mean, I think, you know, there's some great black opera singers, Willard White, Jesse Norman, Marilyn Horn. There have been some fantastic... Uh, um, look at look, Wynton Marsalis as a trumpeter. That, that there's a lot more trouble white people having the, having, singing the blues, as my poor friend Hugh has discovered, when, when <laughs> stupid... <laughs> Stupid people have said that it's somehow wrong for a middle-class Englishman to sing blues music. Uh, no one would dare suggest that it would be wrong for a black man to sing the part of Otello by Verdi. That would be considered obscene. So the fact is, music is international, and I hope, I hope, uh, I hope the crossover goes complete. And I just, my little feeling, I would want to pinch this loaf, my favourite moment, from a Sidney Lumet film called Running on Empty, with the, quite simply, fierce... Um, uh, River Phoenix, and um, he uh, he plays as it. He plays a young boy who's, who's a musical genius, but he's, his family's on the run from the FBI. They have to keep reinventing their identity because they they, napal they, they blew up a napalm building as, as an act of um, you know uh, 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 protest against the Vietnamese war, not knowing there was a, a, a warden uh, on watch in the building who died. So therefore, they were they've been on the run anyway. So he, he arrives at this new school. He's dyed his hair. He's got a new identity. Nobody knows that he's actually musically incredibly gifted. He has this little keyboard he practices on at home all the time. And, um, and he slouches into the, the first lesson he slouches into. It happens to be a music lesson. And the music teacher plays two pieces of music, tells him to go and find his seat. And the first, first piece is a dance track by Madonna, and the second, the second piece is, is, is one of the late Beethoven quartets. And he, he, he plays them, and, the, and, and, and then the music teacher says, so what's the difference? Uh, and a smart kid, thinking he's being clever, says, one's better, and the music... <laughs> Critic says, well, surely that's a, that's a matter of opinion. And, um, and, and we look at River Phoenix, and he's just kind of looking at his feet, and he says, puts his hand up shyly and says, um, you can't dance to Beethoven, mm. which is a fantastic answer. The point about the 20th and 21st century music is that it all turned towards dance, towards dance halls, then towards nightclubs, clubbing, whatever you call it now. The music is all about a beat that is to do with dancing. Now, of course, all music comes from dance, you might argue. People call Beethoven's seventh the apotheosis of dance. But the time signatures change, the rhythms change, there are extraordinary complexities of music. You, don't, you can't really dance to a symphony unless you do one of those horrific hooked on classic things where you go ka -chunka, ka -chunka, ka -chunka, ka -chunka, and then you get William Tell over here followed by... I mean, that is, that is exactly the point. You know, so the, the, the point is you, you, when, the way you listen to or, orchestral classical music is not a dance experience with other people. And that is what people crave and relish now. And you can understand why they do it. It brings them together. They, it gives them a social connection. It reminds them of their youth. When, 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 when everybody's sitting there, whatever you may think of them, going, you know, and I'll fix it for you with, with, their, with their torches and there's Coldplay singing. Now, you may go, oh, a lot of old white middle-class wankers. Or, uh, but, but they are, they're all connected to to the same music that they bought and they listened to when they were young, and they remember it connects them to something, whereas the personal, private in relationship you might have with Mahler or Bruckner or, 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 or whoever it might be with Haydn is something quite different. And to, to say that it's better is, is the wrong... I think yeah. it's just it's the wrong... So but, but also, I think there's a physiological theory that uh, music is not only auditory... But, but it's motoric, so, so that, you know, your, your muscles respond to it. Nietzsche yeah. said that you've got to respond to music with muscles. Nietzsche That's died a, in an yes. in insane asylum. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are a lot of people yeah. <laughs> who have been listening to you. <laughs> OK, now, we have one more comment, and then we're going to have the uh, Wallstein.
Isn't it the case that um, actually most classical music was rubbish and we just happened to end up um, with the stuff that wasn't? Because, and that's why it's lasted. And um, most classical music today is still rubbish, and most of it won't survive into the future. And actually, that uh, classical one of the issues with classical composition today is that um, people perceive classical composers as thinking that innovation is a replacement for quality. Uh, and that's pre presumably a reason why when many classical composers might do something quite innovative, say, with cash registers in their music, people think of it as pretentious nonsense. But when Pink Floyd does it, then it's Dark Side of the Moon. Very, very, very good point.